nothing to us, but it's also a sign between you and us. Just like the rainbow was a sign that you'd never flood the world again, the Sabbath is a sign between us and your majesty and your creation and your power and that you love us. And I thank you. We thank you for your sacrifice and we thank you, Lord, that you give us the ability to understand, to discern, to grow wise. And please, Lord, don't let us grow wise in our own eyes, but, but a wisdom centered upon you. And please make us men and women after your own heart, Lord. Please purify us and renew a right spirit in us. And Lord, as I speak today, please make every word pleasing to you and make it the word that you would speak to your congregation. And Lord, as I speak today, please allow everyone to hear what you would have them to hear. Soften our hearts. And Lord, more than anything, please allow us each moment of today to grow closer to you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So today we're going to talk about the sin of presumption, which, believe it or not, actually has a lot to do with the camping trip that we just went on last week. Because, you see, this whole summer with the youth, we've been doing a lot of stuff, a lot of really awesome stuff, to specifically try to prevent presumptuous sin. And I think by the end of this message, you'll understand why I say that. But some of the stuff we've been doing, on Friday nights, we've been getting together. We've been spending time bringing in the Sabbath together in fellowship. We've been learning more about God. We've been talking together about biblical topics. We've been learning how to grow closer to the Lord. But we haven't just been sitting around while we do it either. We've been hiking. We've been improving our bodies. We've been cooking, learning how to take care of the temple that God gave us for himself. We've been gathering together each Friday night, spending time with each other and with God so that we can guard the edges of the Sabbath. And then on Saturdays, on, on the Sabbath, the third week of each month when we have our fellowship dinner, We've been gathering together and we have been doing book club. And I'll tell you, I don't think there's a single person in the book club that enjoys the writing style of the book that we're reading right now. In fact, it's kind of a, a joke that we have. However, we love the book for the content. Because you know what the content is? It's about our wonderful, gracious Savior and how to have a better relationship with him. And it's amazing. And then we've been organizing things like the trip that we just went on. And I'll tell you, Mariah has been the biggest help. If you guys want to thank Mariah for me, that would be awesome. Because anybody that knows me well knows that I'm good at, at a few things and really, really bad at a lot of things. And one of those things, unfortunately, is planning. But Mariah's great at planning, and she keeps me on track, so it is awesome. Um, but the camping trip this, this week that we went on, last week, I'm sorry, was for a very, very specific purpose. It wasn't just to have fun, and it wasn't just to spend the rest of the Sabbath together in nature. Those are important things. I'm not trying to say that they're not. But it was about practice. Because Nate talks about something all the time, and it's very, very impactful to me. He talks about when you get out into the country, are you going to know how to grow your own food? He talks about when we can't buy or sell, are you going to starve to death, or are you going to know how to grow your own food? And that's important. Because if you don't practice it now, when you can go to the grocery store and buy food when you didn't get it right... What happens when you can't buy it? Are you going to steal to feed yourself? Because it doesn't matter your circumstances. Sin is still sin. Or are you going to learn how to grow your own food? But further than that, what happens when you're driven from your place and we have to flee to the wilderness? 
Are you going to know how to survive? And see, why I want to talk about presumption is because I think there are a lot of ways that presumption presents itself. In fact, it's, it's actually a pretty, pretty overarching topic, the, the definition being an idea that is taken to be true and often used as the basis for other ideas, although it is not known for certain. See, I don't think presumption is always sinful even. I think there's a, a really great example that we all know of, most likely, of presumption, and it'll give us a great idea of, of what a presumptuous sin is. Not that it was sin in and of itself, but it gives us an idea of how it can become sin. I, I think we're all familiar with the great disappointment, am I right? So, a very, very brief recap. All over the world, every continent that is habitated, people began studying Daniel 8. And they realized that the 2300-day prophecy, when it says, and unto 2300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed, they said that 23 days is coming up very, very shortly. They said, in fact, it's coming up in 1844. And they said, the sanctuary is going to be cleansed. Jesus is coming again. But what happened in 1844? You say, nothing happened? Did they know that? No, they didn't. Why? Were they wrong? No, they weren't. They were right. They were exactly right. In 1844, something did happen. But they presumed that the earth was the sanctuary. It was an idea that they took to be true upon which other ideas were based, but they didn't know for certain. And they didn't study more to know for certain. And thankfully, 1,800 years before, God foretold that this would happen. And then after it happened, God led us into truth on the matter. But did that presumption lead many astray? How many thousands of people won't, won't be in eternity because of that presumption? Unfortunately, a lot. Was that in and of itself sinful? No, they were mistaken. But we see other places where presumption does present sin. For example, what did God tell Abraham? He said, your descendants will be more numerous than the sands of this, the earth, more numerous than the stars of the sky. But Abraham was getting old. His wife was barren, and she was old. Abraham presumed to tell God how he would have descendants. And Abraham had a child with a woman he was not married to. Was that sinful? Absolutely. It was a presumptuous sin. And how many millions of people will not make it to eternity because of that sin? In fact, at the bare minimum, over a billion people. Because the Muslim religion came from that presumptuous sin. And there are over a billion people worldwide that follow the Muslim religion today because of Abraham's presumptuous sin. So... I think we fall into some, some presumptuous sins, and that's what I want to talk about today. I think one of the presumptuous sins we fall into, and I don't think this is the worst ever, but I think it's one that we're very, it's very prevalent in our, our midst, is not preparing for the time of trouble. We talk about it a lot. Oh, we talk about it probably more than we need to. Honestly, I think we talk about it more than we should. But are we just giving lip service to it? How many of us, if we were stranded in the wilderness, could survive? After we're driven from our homes, after we can't buy and sell, after we can't even drive to the gas station to fill up to get to the wilderness, we have to walk there. How many of us could even walk to the wilderness in the first place? I'll be the first to say, probably not I. I don't think I'm in good enough shape. Is it presumptuous of me to assume that I could make it there when I don't exercise that often? Yes, it is. Once we get to the wilderness, though, how many of us could start a fire? 
You got your matches with you. Great. What happens when it rains? You got your lighter with you. Awesome. What happens when it runs out of fuel? Could you start a fire without a lighter or matches? What happens if you can't carry a tent with you? It's heavy. What happens if your tent gets destroyed? Could you, could you build a shelter? Your third day in the wilderness, it snows and you have no shelter. Are you going to presume to tell God he has to miraculously save you? Will he? He very certainly could. In fact, God would have saved Christ if he would have thrown himself off the temple. He would have. And Jesus knew it. But what did he tell Satan? Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Jesus wouldn't fall into presumption. And if anybody could presume to tell God what to do, it would be Jesus himself. In, in John, in chapter 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We skip down to verse 14 and it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is very clear. Who is the Word? Jesus. What is the Word? God. Jesus is God. We see in Exodus 33, Moses is sitting in the tent of meeting and it says he's sitting in the tent of meeting with God and it says he's sitting there face to face, talking to him as old friends. Moses literally saw the face of God. But it's really strange because in the same chapter, very shortly afterward, Moses says, Lord, show me your glory. And God says, no man can see my face and live. And it's also strange because Jesus said to his disciples, no man has ever seen the Father. How is this possible if Moses was sitting face to face with God in the tent? Because Moses was sitting face to face with Jesus in the tent. So if someone could presume to tell God what to do, who would it be? Jesus. But did he? No. Did Jesus know that he would be saved? Yes. But did he do it? No. If we're in the wilderness, and I'll say this is, this is I'm worse at this than probably most of you. I can start a fire. I can gather water. I showed them how to start a fire. I can even build a fire pit so that people won't see the smoke or the light from the fire. I can gather water when there's no stream or, or other water source around. I know how to purify water that you couldn't drink otherwise, even if you don't have a fire. But I would not survive two weeks in the wilderness. You know why? Because I have no idea how to forage food. And most of you would probably be better at that than I, because I have no idea what you can eat. That's presumptuous of me, to assume that I'm good to go, because I can start a fire. I can build a shelter. But am I good? No, because I haven't practiced enough in that. Now, we've got an example in the Old Testament. Elijah, he was fed miraculously. Will that happen to us? in the wilderness? Yes. Yes, it will. But are we presumptuous in telling God that he has to feed us miraculously? In my case, I am, apparently, because I have no idea. Last week, when we were sitting out there and we were eating out of these bagged meals, you just pour boiling water in, you let it sit for eight minutes, you got a, a delicious dinner, I realized I have no idea how to forage food. We've got a peach tree down there. Thankfully, I could eat those, but... Man cannot live on peaches alone is probably a pretty good saying. <laughs> I was presumptuously sinning in telling God that he would have to miraculously feed me in the wilderness. What if God has a plan for us to be the light of the world during the time of trouble? But day three into the time of trouble... We were presumptuous and assumed to tell God what he was going to do and how he would dole out his miracles. But that wasn't God's plan in your life, and you die. Do we have examples of people disrupting God's plan? Yes, absolutely. In fact, Ellen White talks about 
how it was not God's plan for Paul to be beheaded in Rome when he was. But Paul insisted. And we, we see in the Bible where numerous prophets came to Paul on the way to Jerusalem and they said, don't go. And Paul said, you don't know what you're talking about. This is God's will. And eventually, a prophet had to come and show Paul, this is how you will be bound. God didn't want him to go, but he refused. He was being presumptuous. And thankfully, God had a lot of good come from that. But was it his original plan? No, it wasn't. And what happens if we're presumptuous at the end of time? Are we going to be presumptuous and one other person is going to lose their salvation because of it? What if only five other people are going to lose their salvation because of it? What if, like Abraham's presumptuous sin, a billion people lose their salvation because of it? Could you stand to live with yourself in eternity for that? And I'm not trying to guilt trip us. I'm certainly not. Because that leads me into the second thing I want to talk about, the second presumptuous sin that we have. And unfortunately, I think this one's even more prevalent in our lives, and this one is significantly more important. Because will God forgive you if you didn't learn how to start a fire in the wilderness and you die because of it? Yes, he absolutely will. You're not going to go to hell for it. Well, I mean, if your relationship with God is bad, that's a problem. But you won't go to hell for not learning how to start a fire. But the, the bigger problem for us comes down to the fact that as a whole, unfortunately, we focus too much on the law. And, and don't hear me wrong when I say that, because the law is very, very, very important. If you do not follow the law, I will be clear. If you do not follow the law, you will not make it to heaven. However, you can follow the law and not make it to heaven. Just like the Jewish man that I, I referenced earlier that asked this Catholic bishop if he was going to make it to heaven because he followed the law. The Catholic bishop said, you're good. No, no, you're not. In fact, Paul said, if there was a man that followed the law and was good to go, it was I. And I was a man condemned. The law doesn't save us. What saves us? Christ. More specifically, our relationship with him. Did God create us to be slaves and follow a law, a set of do's and don'ts? No, he didn't. What did God create us for? Companionship. And that's what he wants to restore in us. The Bible is a love story, a beautiful, wonderful love story. In fact, we know that for sure. We know it for a fact. How do we know it? Flip with me really fast over to 1 John 4. I think I was the one who takes the longest there. So what can we say the Bible is? The Word of God, right? If the Word of God is the Bible, it tells us of God, right? Well, 1 John 4, 8, what does it say God is? It, said, it says, He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So if this is the Word of God... It tells us of God. It's a love story. It tells us of the ultimate love, God's love. You see, in the beginning, God created a perfect situation. Perfect world. Perfect animals. Perfect people. Perfect relationship with Him. And He said it was very good. And then we messed it up. Because we chose to reject his love. And then the rest of the Bible is all about God's attempt to woo us back to him, to woo his bride back to him, to win our affection 
and to restore that relationship that we saw at the beginning and we see again at the end. But we unfortunately get caught so often focused on the law, just the law. Unfortunately, when we ask, how do you get to heaven? Most people do not say by having a good relationship with God. Most people say by being a good person, by following the law, by being a good Christian, by doing this or doing that. And that is presumptuous because that unfortunately is working your way into heaven. Now again, you cannot have a good relationship with God if you don't follow the law. You know how I know? Because I've never had a friend that remained my friend when I spit in their face every day. And God won't either. But I've also had people that I was not friends with that I didn't ever spit in their face. Because I can follow the law and not be a friend of God. Jesus talked about those people. He said, at the end of time, they'll stand before him and they'll say, we even cast out demons in your name. What do you mean I'm not on the, on the list? I'm not in the book of life. What do you mean I'm not getting entrance into the city? And he'll say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. And why does he say depart from me? Because I never knew you. Not because you weren't perfect. Not because, hey, you ate pork one time. You're not coming in. He doesn't say that. He says, I never knew you. Now, the Bible is clear. Again, if you're going to have a true relationship, all the other stuff is important. It is important. Again, you won't make it to heaven if you don't obey the law. But I just want to be very, very clear that our problem with presumption is presuming to work our way into heaven instead of work on our relationship with Christ. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. It's the same with our relationship with him. Seek first a true, godly love of the Lord and you'll follow the law. It'll be added unto you. Why would you not? What killed Christ? What put him on the cross? Sin. Absolutely sin did. If you love him, do you want to go back to the object of his torment and death? No. It's not about, at that point, it's not about being a good person even. It's not about heaven. It's about God. It's about, I would give up eternity to spend a moment with you. If I could spend but a moment with you. Eternity's great, and heaven's great, and it's going to be awesome living forever. But who cares about living forever if it's not spent with God? And when we can get to that point, then we can let go of that presumption. And we can say what David said over in Psalm 19. Flip over there with me really fast, and we'll close out. In Psalm 19, verse 13, David said, Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. And then what's he say? Then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of great transgression. It's interesting that David didn't say, Lord, please keep me from, from adultery then I'll be blameless. David had a problem with that. It's interesting that David didn't say, keep me from murder, and then I'll be blameless, because David had a problem with that. 
It's interesting that he didn't say, keep my anger in check, for then I'll be blameless, because David had a problem with that as well. A man simply said he wouldn't feed David's men, and David went to kill him. That's an anger problem if I've ever seen one. But David said, keep me from presumption, and then I will be blameless. Because if you don't presume to know the will of God, but you humbly come before him and you beseech him for his will, if you don't presume to have a right standing with God and every day you humbly come before him and you ask for a greater relationship with him, these things are what hold us from being blameless and sinless before the Lord. And if God can take that presumption from us, just like David said, we'll be blameless before him. Now again, I'm not trying to say we'll be sinless. In 1 John 1, it says, if any man says he's without sin, he deceives himself and the truth isn't in him. But we will be blameless if each day we humbly come before God and we ask him, just like David, keep me from presumption. Restore my relationship with you and make it deeper and more full of love than ever before. And that's the biggest problem that we have today, I think, is that presumption. Now, I think you guys are probably a lot better about it than I am. But if we can each every day come before God and ask for a release from that presumption... I think we'll be a lot closer to him. And I think the earth will be a lot closer to his kingdom at that point as well. So thank you guys. If you wouldn't mind praying with me to close out the sermon. Praying for more of God's love and less of our presumption. I hope you guys got something from the message today. Again, I don't want you to get from the message that we can just forget about the law because that's not it at all. I hope you, what you got from the message today is that in everything we do, especially our relationship with Christ, we should come before him every single day, ask his will, and then not be afraid to do it.